Grace, mercy, and peace are yours. From God our Father, through Jesus Christ, our living Lord and Savior. Amen. As I mentioned back at the beginning of the service last week, we looked at a very important question. Is God real? Today we look at an equally important question. Is the Bible true? What do you know about God? Well, if you, if you read the Bible, you know, for example, that God is holy and triune and loving and eternal and all-knowing and, and all-present and all-powerful and, and uh, unchanging, merciful. You know all those things from reading the Bible. But for a moment, let's take away the Bible. Now what do you know about God? Hmm. Don't know much, do you? What about Jesus? What do you know about him? Again, not very much. What about heaven or hell or how to get to heaven? Again, not very much which really highlights the importance of today's topic. You see, virtually everything that we believe is based on the Bible. So, how do we know the Bible is true? How do I know that the Bible is not full of mistakes and errors? How do I know the Bible is not like any other book in the library? That's the way many people look at it, you know. But it's just like any other book written by human beings and therefore subject to human flaws and opinions and, and bias. How do I know that what the Bible says is true and that I can really believe it? Well, obviously the Bible is a human document. It was written by people, just like you and me. And yet there are a number of things about the Bible that make it different from any other book, that make it special and unique, and that indicate that it is true. First of those is that the Bible was inspired. And I realize that, that people say that about other books too. For example, uh, a reporter might interview someone who survived the sinking of the Titanic, and they would be so inspired after that conversation with that person that they might feel like writing a book about it. That's not what we mean when we say that the Bible is inspired. What we mean is that the people who wrote the Bible didn't just write it on their own. They were guided and prompted to write what they did by God himself. That's the point that the Apostle Paul is making in our first scripture lesson from 2 Timothy chapter 3. Paul writes, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. All scripture is God-breathed. That's where the word inspiration comes from. It means to breathe in. God breathed into the people who wrote the Bible. He put it in their hearts to write down the things that they did. He put in their minds the, the thoughts and ideas that they should write down. He, he guided them in writing what they did. In some cases, he, he gave them the very words to say and write. He inspired them. Notice, too, that Paul says, all Scripture is God-breathed. Not just some of it, not just parts of it, all of it. From the story of creation to the story of Noah and the flood, to the Psalms of David, all the way to the songs of the saints and angels in heaven recorded in the book of Revelation. From the account of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem to the account of his resurrection on the third day. All of it is true. All of it is inspired by God. And that's one of the reasons you and I can be sure that the Bible is true. 
Second reason, Peter also talks about in his second letter, he also talks about how the, the Bible was inspired. In 2 Peter chapter 1, Peter refers to an event in Jesus' life that they could, you know, they could have been accused of making up. The story of Jesus' transfiguration. I mean, can't you just hear the critics back then? Oh, come on. You mean to tell me that Jesus' face just started shining? And his clothes just started glowing? You mean to tell me that you, you heard this voice come from a cloud? Come on. You can't be serious. But notice what Peter says. We did not follow cleverly invented stories when we told you about the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. In other words, Peter is saying, we didn't make it up. We didn't invent that story. We saw it with our own eyes. We heard it with our own ears. You can believe it. It really happened. And then Peter goes on to say that we should also believe and trust all of the, what, the, what the prophets say. Why? Look at verse 21. For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. What's Peter saying? He's saying that what the prophets wrote didn't come from them. It didn't originate with them. So, for example, it didn't originate with Moses to, to write down what he did in the book of Genesis. Or it didn't originate with David to write down what he did in the book of Psalms. Or with Isaiah, the things that he wrote in the book that bears his name. It didn't originate with them. It came from God. God is the one who prompted them to, to write the things that he did. He is the one who guided them and assisted them. Moses had help when he wrote the book of Genesis. David had help when he wrote the book of Psalms. Isaiah had help when he wrote the prophecies recorded in his book. Divine help. Each and every one of them was guided, was assisted, was carried along by the Holy Spirit. So the fact that the, the Scriptures were inspired by God is one reason we can be sure the Bible is true. Second reason is the Bible's historical accuracy. Over the years, scholars have often doubted the Bible's accuracy when it comes to historical people, places, and events. They've also been questioned whether certain people or places in the Bible ever existed or certain events ever took place. Let's look at our third scripture lesson, the one from, from the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 18. Then the Lord said, The outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is so great and their sin so grievous that I will go down and see if what they have done is as bad as the outcry that has reached me. If not, I will know. For many years, scholars pointed to these verses as proof that the Bible was wrong. Because for many, many years, there was no evidence outside the Bible that those cities of Sodom and Gomorrah ever existed. But then in 1964, archaeologists began digging at a site in northern Syria called Tel Mardik. There they found some 17,000 clay tablets. Surprisingly, among those clay tablets was a list of some of the cities in the region. And among the cities listed was the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. The Bible turned out to be true after all. Another example is found in the book of Daniel, Jan Daniel chapter 5. There it lists Belshazzar as king of Babylon. The problem was that for many, many years, there was no evidence outside the Bible that a guy named Belshazzar ever served as king of Babylon. So again, the Bible was said to be wrong. Then in 1956, 
archaeologists dug up three stones with inscriptions on them. And those inscriptions solved the mystery. It seems that the man who was king of Babylon at that time had decided to lead his armies on an extended military campaign in faraway lands. And so, while he was gone, he temporarily installed his son as king in his absence. Anyone want to guess what his son's name was? Belshazzar. So again, the Bible proved to be right. And that has happened in so many cases. There are so many instances like that where the scholars questioned whether the Bible was really true, whether those people or places or events really happened. And each and every time, the Bible proved to be true. Nelson Glick, the famous Jewish archaeologist, has said, It may be stated categorically, that no archaeological discovery has ever controverted a biblical reference. In other words, the Bible is always right. Another reason we can sure, be sure the Bible is true. Third reason is the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. As you know in reading the Bible, there are many, many, many prophecies in the Bible. And many of them are related to the coming of the promised Messiah. Some of these prophecies about Jesus were written hundreds, even more than a thousand years before Jesus was born. A good example is the one recorded in the book of Micah, one we often hear at Christmas time. But you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from of old, from ancient times. There, in that prophecy, the prophet Micah foretells that one day the Savior would be born in Bethlehem. And, as you know, that's exactly where he was born. There are many passages like that. One that says that the coming Savior would be born of a virgin. Another one that foretells that he would come from the tribe of Judah. Another one that says that he would come from the house of David. Another one that says that he would be betrayed for 30 pieces of silver. Another that he would have his hands and his feet pierced. And on and on and on. Altogether, there are over 300 prophecies in the Bible that were fulfilled in the life and ministry of Jesus. So, what are the chances of something like that happening? What are the chances that all of these prophecies many of them written hundreds or even more than a thousand years before Jesus lived, what are the chances that these prophecies would all be fulfilled in one person? Well, using the mathematical science of, uh, of probability, Peter Stoner has figured that if, for one person to fulfill even eight of those messianic prophecies, the chances would be one in ten to the seventeenth power. You heard me correctly. The chances of those prophecies, eight of those prophecies being fulfilled in one person would be one in 10 to the 17th power. That's a one with 17 zeros behind it. Now, just for comparison's sake, they say that your chances of winning the Powerball jackpot are one in 195 million. So, in other words, you'd have a better chance of winning the Powerball jackpot than fulfilling eight of those prophecies about the coming Savior. But just to help you grasp how amazing that is, here's an illustration. Let's say I had a silver dollar, and I put a special little mark on that silver dollar. Then I took that silver dollar and put it in a bucket full of silver dollars, and then I asked you to reach in, of course you couldn't look, you reach in and pull out that silver dollar. Okay, well actually, the bucket isn't big enough. So, how about a whole dump truck full of silver dollars? I'll put my silver dollar in with all of the, those silver dollars in the dump truck. Actually, the dump truck isn't big enough either. Let's say that I covered the entire state of Texas 
with silver dollars. Silver dollars two feet deep. And then I took my silver dollar, the one that had the mark on it, and mixed it in with all those silver dollars. And then I blindfolded you and said that, okay, you could walk across the state of Texas as far as you wanted, but at one point you had to kneel down and pick up one silver dollar, and that had to be mine with the mark on it. What would be the chances of you picking my silver dollar? One in 10 to the 17th power. The fulfillment of biblical prophecy is another amazing statement about the Bible's truth. Final one is the testimony of Jesus himself. In the Gospel of John, Jesus made a rather striking statement about the Bible. He said in chapter 17, Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. Jesus, of course, was referring to God's word recorded in the Old Testament scriptures, the same Old Testament scriptures that you and I have in our Bibles. Notice what he says. It's truth. It's not a bunch of man-made stories. It's not just a human record of events full of opinion and bias and errors. It's truth. So if we ever had any doubts about the Bible, if we ever had any doubts whether we really could believe what the Bible says, Jesus clears them up for us. He says categorically that it's truth. And yet, there are still people who doubt the Bible and question the Bible and mock the Bible and scoff at what it says and say that the Bible is full of all kinds of errors and mistakes and, and contradictions. What do you suppose such people deserve from God on the last day? Free ticket into his heavenly kingdom? I rather doubt it. But what about people like you and me? People who claim to be followers of Jesus, believers in Jesus, and yet people who also at times have, have doubted God's word and questioned God's word and ignored God's word and flagrantly disobeyed God's word. What do we deserve from God in the last day? The honor and privilege of living with Him in His kingdom? No. We too deserve to be shut out, banished from His kingdom, banished to that place reserved for all the scoffers and the doubters and the unbelievers, that awful place called hell. Thank God we have the Bible. Thank God we have this book from God that tells us the truth, not only about our sins, but even more importantly about our Savior, Jesus. Yes, it is important that we recognize our sins. Because until we do, until we do recognize our sins and repent of them, they will forever be a roadblock and a stumbling block in our relationship with God. But even more importantly, God has given us this book so that we might learn about our Savior Jesus. The one who came into this world and gave his life on the cross to pay for all of our sins, including all of the times that we doubted God's word and questioned God's word and ignored God's word and failed to live according to his word. Jesus gave his life on the cross to pay for all of those sins so that we might be forgiven. So that on the last day, the judge of heaven might not throw the book at us. But that on the last day, we might receive everything this book promises. An unending life of peace and joy and, and glory in heaven. This is the reason, the main reason God has given us this book. And, that, and also why he urges us to believe it with all our hearts. Apostle John says it like this toward the end of his gospel. These are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. Amen.